Okay. Okay, let's, um, let's get started. Our next speaker today, Professor Luis uh, Viseira, will uh, report on joint work with uh, John Campbell of Harvard University and with our uh, prize recipient today. Uh, this work exemplifies uh, Schiller's commitment to studying and uh, proposing financial instruments appropriate for ordinary households faced with important risks. It focuses on an instrument that is neither very new nor unconventional or exotic, uh, but one that is still not very broadly used, not very broadly uh, exploited, inflation-indexed bonds. The talk investigates the appropriateness of indexed bonds for the long-term investor, for example, for households planning for retirement. Luis Viseira is the George Bates Professor at the Harvard Business School. His research focuses on the analysis of asset allocation strategies for long-term investors, both individuals and institutions, in the face of changing interest rates, uh, risk premia, and risk. He has written a most influential book on the subject of asset allocation, together with uh, John Campbell. Quite interestingly for today's discussion, Professor Viseira has been appointed a member of the Board of Trustees of the Financial Accounting Foundation, the governing body over accounting uh, standards setting in the United States, including the Financial Accounting Standards Board and the Government Accounting Standards Board. It's a pleasure to introduce Luis Viseira. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you, everyone. I feel very honored and to be here and presenting some work I have been doing jointly with, uh, lately joining with uh, John Campbell and Bob Schiller, uh, who is the person receiving the award today. And to me, it's actually quite a happy occasion. I have known Bob for, for quite a few years. The first uh, personal contact I had with him was actually when I first got to know what inflation index bonds were. That was around 1997 or 1996 when the Treasury, uh, the United States Treasury was thinking about launching those bonds. And uh, at that point, uh, Bob Schiller and John Campbell were interested in getting to know how these bonds were going to be likely to evolve in the, in the United States. And lo and behold, I was then a graduate student at Harvard, and I was working at the National Bureau of Economic Research doing some research uh, assistantship. And I had a chance to meet Bob and, and work as a research assistant for that, for that work. So long and behold, 12 years later, we have this work that is basically thinking more about these bonds, thinking about the history of these bonds in the United States and, uh, and the United Kingdom, and trying to get a sense of uh, you know, what, do, what have we learned in these uh, past few years. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be giving you a little bit of history on these bonds. I think they are in interesting and important instruments. I also chose to present this paper because I think it summarizes very well uh, one of, uh, or pr probably two of uh, Bob's, uh, you know, interests in research, one which is behavioral finance, and we'll see there is uh, something to think about from that perspective about how these markets have evolved over time, especially over the last year, and also because, as I will argue in my presentation, I think they are very important uh, instruments for households. So these are not, uh, as Michael was saying, exotic instruments in the least. Actually, they are quite important instruments for, uh, for uh, small savers like probably most of the people uh, in, in this room, as I will argue in my, in my presentation. So let me, go, let, me get, uh, let me get to it. So I understand that uh, the, the German government has not issued these bonds or had issued only a few, a few of these uh, issues on these bonds. So maybe this, this audience is not very familiar on how these bonds work. So I, I thought I should give you just a, I hope you don't feel insulted if I give you like the very basics of how these bonds work. And then I'll give you a his, the history and why I think these are important instruments to keep in mind. So an inflation index bonds is essentially a bond whose principal and, in, and coupons adjust uh, uh, with inflation. So here is an example of a hypothetical bond with 10, year to maturi with 10 years to maturity and uh, with, um, with a 10% uh, coupon. So the, blue line, the, the red line describes how, what kind of payments you would be getting on this bond over time. Right? Under the assumption that say, you know, you issue the bond today and over the next 10 years, inflation happens to be 5% annually over the next 10 years. 
So basically what's going to happen is you're, you're going to be receiving coupons that uh, are going to be growing with inflation. And at the end of the 10 years, you're going to get your principal that at issuance is, was, uh, in fact, let's assume was $100 or 100 euros. So at the end of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the 10 year period, you're going to get not just your 100 euros back, you're going to get your 100 euros compounded by whatever inflation happened over the next, over the next 10 years. Plus, whatever is the coupon that gets paid at that time, which is going to be, you know, 10 euros at inception, plus all the accumulated inflation on, that, on those 10 euros. So if you think about that, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of the 10 years, you would be receiving a payment that would be close to 180 euros, rather than just 110 euros, which is what you would be getting with a, with a, with a nominal bond. Of course, adjusted for inflation or for you would be getting 10 euros every year, and at the end of the day, adjusted for inflation, you would be getting 110 euros. But so the, what these bonds do is they preserve the purchasing power of those coupons and, and, and principal. Contrast that with what a nominal bond, typical government bond is, and that's for you. So that's the, a, a standard nominal government bond, right? With the same coupon 10%, but it, it is not adjusted for inflation. So, of course, in, terms, in nominal terms, you end up getting, that's the, um, that would be the, uh, the, uh, the blue line, you end up getting 10 euros every period, and at the end of the day, 110, not 180. And I, but if you think about the purchasing power of those coupons and principal, you will find yourself that if you bought that bond with that 10% coupon, the bond in, in, with a 5% inflation, same case as before, the, the purchasing power of those coupons would be declining dramatically, and at the end of the day, your principal of 100 euros and plus 10 euros uh, of, of last coupon would be worth barely, barely 60 euros instead of 110. So basically, in real terms, in inflation adjusted terms, you would be, be getting half of what you were promised in, uh, in that. There is no default in this bond. You were promised to get a fixed string of, uh, of nominal payments, but obviously you are, think, you are now getting that these bonds can be quite risky if inflation turned out to be not what we expected when we bought these bonds with that kind of 10% 10 coupon. So this is how uh, inflation index bonds differ from, uh, from uh, regular government nominal, nominal bonds. The modern era for inflation index bonds actually began in the United Kingdom uh, uh, with the first issues that they happened, I think, during the Thatcher, last Thatcher administration in the, in the early 1980s. The U.S. Treasury followed about 12, 13 years later when they started using, uh, uh, issuing inflation index bonds in, uh, in 1997. Uh, in the U.S., those bonds are called Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, or TIPS for short. So I might be referring to either IIDs or TIPS over, over my presentation. Interestingly, they have been also issued in other countries, Canada, France, Japan, among others, and my understanding is that the German government has issued a couple of those issues, I think a couple of those bonds in the last, in the last, in the last few years. But in the U.S. and in the U.K., actually, these bonds are uh, growing quite a bit as a, as a share both of total public debt, total government debt, and also as a share of, uh, of GDP. On the left-hand side, we have, for the history of uh, uh, TIPS in the U.S. from 19, the end of 1997 all the way through, through last year, the, uh, the uh, dashed line represents the proportion that that represents of the, ish, the, the outstanding months represents over GDP. The black line represents the percentage of, uh, of, of debt. And in the U.S., as of today, these bonds represent about 10% of all the outstanding government debt, uh, treasury debt, and about 3.5% uh, of GDP. In the UK, the evolution has been even more dramatic. There has been some slowdowns like in the US in the, in the early 2000s or in the, uh, in the UK in the, in the early 1990s, but the overall trend has been increasing. And in the UK, they represent today about one third of all uh, outstanding public debt, government debt uh, in the UK, and about 6-7% uh, of, of GDP. So they are quite sizable now as a share of GDP and as a share of, of, of public debt. Why are these bonds interesting? So I, let, me, let me show you a little bit of what's the, uh, the history of the yields or the interest rates that those bonds have been paying. This is uh, for the US. 
The blue line represents the yield on, uh, on a constant maturity 10-year uh, uh, tip or, or, or inflation index bonds since issuance in 1997 all the way through uh, actually early, early 2009. If you think about uh, the yields or the interest rate paid on these bonds, they actually do reflect something we didn't get to observe, uh, for which we didn't get to observe market prices or market values until these bonds were issued, which is the real interest rates in the economy as it, it is assessed by the markets. If you think about the yield on any of these bonds, it's actually a real yield. It represents the economy-wide real interest rates, and if you have a full-term structure of these of, of this bonds, you get to see how the market assesses the real-term structure of